scene right now. <laughs> okay, good I, stuff. I, I, I'm parked and we are not moving, um, but we're doing another session of I'm in a car, so I'm gonna make sure I'm not distracted and we're just gonna be having a conversation. Yeah. And this just happens to be recording this while we do it. Yeah. And so I have the pleasure of having Hugh Obrodovich with me. Um, and I mean, I, I can't begin to address the, the accolades and the resume that you've built up over your career. So maybe for the sake of, of the audience, you can give us a little introduction in terms of like what you're up to today and kind of how you got there over the last couple of years. Okay. Well, I've recently retired. Um, when I stopped working, I was the chair of pediatrics at Stanford University and the physician in chief at their uh, children's hospital. Right. Uh, throughout Pretty my major position. Yeah. Fairly large organization. Fairly. <laughs> and uh, my responsibility as the chair of pediatrics and physician in chief is really several fold. One is to ensure that the children and family that come to the hospital receive the best possible state-of-the-art care. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that uh, we need to have future health care providers. I happen to have just retired, so who replaces me? So one of the major roles is to train future health care providers, and in my case specifically, uh, pediatricians and allied people. Yep. Uh, the third is that although there have been many phenomenal advances in the care of children and their health has improved and we've done so much sadly there's still a significant cadre of infants and children where either we can't save them or they end up with significant problems if, with their health and so it's critical to f discover and do research to determine new ways to prevent disease right. and importantly new ways to cure disease so that children and their family can live long healthy lives. Yeah. Um, the other final which I always add into the uh, clinical care research and education is I feel is administrative and financial responsibility. Right. It doesn't matter if you're in Canada where we spend 10% of our gross national product on health care in the states where they spend roughly 18%. Health care is an unusual business or service because there's an unlimited demand right. and a limited supply. Yeah. So it behooves leaders in these areas to use every dollar that you have efficiently, wisely, and as effectively as you can. Right. Because there is an unlimited demand and that's in part what you read about in the paper or watch on TV or sure. read on your blog. Right. right. Which source you use for most of your knowledge acquisition. Yeah, and I mean, that, that creates a very interesting challenge in itself. So how did you end up in that position with, with Stanford? Well, I um, went up the ranks over the years. I, I always uh, felt that I should lead by example, so that's why I continue to do clinical care as a pediatric lung specialist, uh, do my own research and education. But at Sick Kids, uh, when I moved there in 1986, uh, shortly thereafter, I became division chief of the pediatric pulmonary division. Then in 1996, I became uh, chair of pediatrics and uh, pediatrician in chief at Sick Kids, and did that for 10 years. Wow! And then uh, after I f uh, finished that, um, I was approached by the dean of medicine at uh, Stanford, and so I took on comparable positions down there and yeah. uh, the roles were, were similar in two different systems but again uh, more similarities than differences and so I was down in uh, Stanford University which is just south of uh, San Francisco in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was down there from uh, January 2008 until I retired a couple of years ago. It was awesome. So I mean sick kids that must have been an unbelievable experience too just to see the kind of impact that would have on on a regular basis. I mean, Stanford, obviously, very similar in terms of the impact you're having. Yeah. You said something there that I thought was really interesting, though, that you, you always felt this uh, requirement to lead by example. Mm -hmm. Can you just break that down a little bit for us? Well, it's important that if you think about the folks that either you supervise, work with, whatever, they need to know that you're part of their team. And so I'll give you some examples. It's it's always easy to think of the nice things of your job when things go well, uh, sure. but when things don't go so well, you can have a uh, building a relationship. So when you're looking after children and 
good things happen and they thrive, that's great. On the other hand, one of the hardest things of being a pediatrician is that sometimes children don't do well and yeah. unfortunately sometimes they die. So again, um, you can have this relationship to help support your faculty because it's not easy for faculty or for anybody. a physician, anybody yeah. when, when this tragically happens. Um, and the same thing, whether it's with education or uh, research, you know, some people get their research paper rejected for publication. Well, you know, it's sort of nice to know that, you know, it happened to me too. You know, it's not like everybody's wonderful or others aren't. Um, so I, I think it's really important to lead by example. One of the interesting things um, when I was down in Silicon Valley was that Hewlett Packard, which really was one of the very starting companies in, in Silicon Valley. Both uh, uh, Packard and Hewlett, Bill Hewlett and David Packard, they used to always quote walk the floor. So right. even they were both engineers and they would go around so they continue, continuously interacted. And I think that's really important. Too many organizations have it where you have this tiered uh, the ivory tower, so to speak. Ivory tower. Yeah. And so whether or not you're in the healthcare business or financial business or you name it or even in the military, right? If you think of which generals or leader are most thought of, it's always, gee, they were amongst the men and women who were fighting for their country. And so I think that uh, they can relate to it. You're, obviously, you need to have leaders and you need to have lieutenants and you need right. to have sergeants and you need to have buck privates. But I think it's important that everybody sees that you're part of the same team. And, you know, you can even use the sports analogy, right? I mean, whether you're the... Uh, the kicker on the football team who gets on once a, once a, a game or you're the center that's out there all the time you need to be able to relate to the quarterback and the coach yeah that's cool and I think what you said there really illustrates it nicely that by being part of the team you're able to relate more and when you can relate more you can build a stronger relationship yeah and then leadership really is around relationships I'll give you a, a concrete example uh, I've lived through the implementation of two totally new electronic health care records right Although there's, there's I, like, I lived through like as if you might not have. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, well, it was a huge project. Exactly, these are huge, and although there's uh, fanciful descriptions of how wonderful this is, once when they're implemented, it is a huge burden that's placed on the physicians. So here you are as a leader saying, you know what? We actually will be better off with electronic healthcare records. And by the way, you've got to do this. And we're going to have you spend another 20% of your day doing this, which really helps a variety of other things, but doesn't directly benefit you. There's many right. things that do benefit you. So when you're sitting around the computer screen trying to learn this whole new computer system, and your faculty are frustrated by it, it's in some ways, at least I've always thought that it was useful for them to see, you know what, the boss is having just as much trouble with this as I am. And we're all in this boat together and we're rowing the oars around yeah. the Cape of Good Hope and we'll get around it and then we'll hit some calm waters. It's so important what you just said there too. And I think, you know, um, technology is is impacting business. Yes. Well, the world. It's not yeah. just business, right? <clears throat> Not-for-profits, healthcare, you know, business, whatever that might be. And, you know, what you say, and the boss is having as much trouble with us. So we'll all row those oars and, and get there yeah. together. It's so important for leaders that invest in technology to be the people that lead the adoption of the technology. Yeah. And really, it's it's uh, you've addressed technology, but it's like any other aspect of Change. working with human beings. Everybody wants progress, but most people don't want to change. Right. <laughs> yeah, dichotomy. So it's really a challenge, and this is a feature of human beings. And so, how do you do this? And you've probably seen the classic you know, circle where they have, you know, probably five or ten percent of human beings are innovators. Right. Yeah. And then you have the early adopters. Sure. Who say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Then you have the late adopters and they're always saying, yeah, but how about this and how about this? And what leaders have to realize that actually if you can get those folks on side, they end up in the long term being your strongest supporters. So right. as a leader, it's important to identify the, the various folks. And then, of course, there's always a few percent that it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> Kick um, it and scream it. Yeah, and so how do you sort of uh, try to minimize the impact they would have on the rest of the team? You right. know, that guy's never going to kick a field goal, or that guy couldn't catch a ball or right. throw a ball, and you know, 
there are the odd cynics around that one has to deal with. Right, and I think with that it's a really cool example, though, about a leader's um, requirement from a communication point of view to not only talk about why we're doing this, but also articulate the vision of the, the solution uh, situation. So once we've gone through this painful transition, yeah. the world will look this way and do so as specifically as possible. Yeah. And I think that's where I've struggled a lot, and I'm learning now that I have to do a better job. Well, uh, what I, I can see a lot of things in my head, but it doesn't mean everybody else can see it too. That's right. Well, one of the approaches I had uh, to help the faculty address challenging situations or other people, I used to call them the uh, Rodovich three questions. Okay, nice. Yeah, and when life presents you with a challenge or various other things, there's really only uh, three questions. You know, it's, I have a problem, what can I do about it? Number two question is, we have a problem, what can we do about it? Right. And then there's a number three problem. There is a huge problem out there. It is really important. It's really affecting what we're doing. But you know what? We can't do anything about it. Right. And so when you're looking at trying to change how people approach life, if you get a, a, a group or even, we tend as human beings to focus on number three problems. Uh, right? It's sort of, well, you know, uh, we don't, we have a long waiting list in, in, in hospitals or whatever you're doing. You know, there's some things that, that we as an individual don't have control over. Right. And so what you need to do is then reflect it back and say, well, what can I do about this if I have a problem? What can we as a team do together? And in fact, actually, sometimes what you can do is to, you know, if you're in a, in, in a, uh, boardroom where you're working with your people, you can even put up there, well, let, let's make uh, a number three list. Right. And so when all of a sudden, when the irresistible force of human beings gets back to the number three, probably say, Billy or Susie, that's a really important point, and it's a really important problem. But we've already agreed that this group here can't do anything about it, so we're going to put it on the shelf. Now, what can number two, what can we do about this issue, you know, whether it's, I'm sure, it, it down or, yeah, I'm sure it intri intrigue, you could uh, go along and uh, say, well, you know, our company is facing these challenges, and so what are we going to do about it, but there's number one, number two, number three. I love it, that's really a cool way to frame things, and to keep focus in terms of what can be possibly changed, which is really cool, Yeah, and it's a good tool, it's a nice yes. simple tool. Yeah, and you keep people away from frustrating and unproductive conversations about very important things but that we can't affect them. Yeah, well, and, and, and then in a large group environment or even a small group environment, they're typically not cheap environments. Like the people that are in those rooms are typically paid well. And Correct. So then you don't want to be working on problems that can't be solved because then you don't go anywhere and there's no progress. Yeah. And even before what you were saying, people are motivated by progress. So Exactly. Um, coming back to this you know, kind of rising of the ranks. Uh, did you find in your experience as a leader that what you did to lead at one level didn't work at the next level? And then there was this like, oh my God, I gotta change the way I'm doing things. And then how did you approach that if that happened? Uh, surprise question, I hadn't th thought about that. Uh, I think there is a huge difference is when you are a member of the team and a peer group and purely, you know, sort of, if you imagine there's uh, 10 pediatric pulmonologists working together and then all of a sudden you become their division head. Right. It changes the relationship in, yeah. in both directions. Um, one of it is that um, as a leader you then have hopefully both accountability and responsibility. Right. Because sometimes organizations get into trouble because they... Uh, they, they hold people responsible, but they don't give them the tools to do it, you know, right. or the things somebody comes in. And I think your relationship with your, the folks that you're leading, you always have to be cognizant of it because your role has changed. How yeah. people perceive you is different. To the day I retired, I always saw myself just a pediatric pulmonologist right you know but well no that's not what the case because no matter how you change that you still have this 
visible and subtle and invisible thing that no, you're the person that's leading them. And so the, you know, the interactions change, right? Yeah. So a, what kind of tips can you give to people? Like we um, see this a lot where you've got a group of peers and then someone becomes a lead or a leader yes. or a manager or whatever. Yeah. And so what kind of tips would you give to somebody in their career that's experiencing that kind of transition? Uh, it's a combination of qualities. I think what's really important is clarity and transparency as to you know where is our our group, our division, our organization, our company going. So everybody knows: Are we trying to trying to go from here to Saskatoon or from here to Halifax? Right? I mean, if you got people going in both directions, you don't know. So, what's your your core goals? Where we're going, uh, and and how we do that. Secondly, is clear expectations as to what do we expect from you? You know, what's your role and what's my role? And that doesn't mean in a superior, inferior type of Oh, but just of how idea. do we contribute together now? How do we get to, towards that? You know, we should have a shared goal. We are partnering to achieve this shared goal. And what's your role and what's the other person's role? Yeah, and um, That's really cool. and so if you get down together, and uh, I'll give you an example of how words really matter. Okay. okay? Uh, when I became chair at the hospital for sick children, at the University of Toronto, it was really important that we changed from the typical everybody functioning on their own to making it more of a an approach where as a teen and really feeling this so I put together what in the business world would be thought to be well, pretty whole home and pretty standard so and we spent a year consultating with the faculty doing this and we brought it out and it was called the performance management compensation program okay which you know I mean for most businesses it's it's okay, okay yeah it's a sunny day and what's the big thing but when you get into the culture of academics yeah. who are high aspiring, they've been at the front of their class or at the university, for someone to come in and call it a performance management, I mean, why don't you just light a fire under them? And so we started, and I had never really <laughs> realized this. So took the same program, called it career development okay. and compensation program. Right. And the significant majority of people, yeah, that's exactly what I want because <laughs> that's so good. This leader wants to help develop my career, and in fact, I would return now. Although oh, that's I learned, beautiful. That's learned, beautiful. Learned some concepts from business, such as performance management. But you know what? Personally, uh, I find that maybe where business could learn from the other thing at intrigue. They should be talking to everybody about what's the best for your career development. I love that. And this gets back to the number one problem. You know, you have a problem you want to develop your career. So what can you do about it? Well, you know, we set, we agree upon my goals and I'm going to go off to my desk or wherever you are and I'm going to achieve that. That's what I've got to do. Yeah. Number two problems, we are going to sit down together and say, what should your goals be? Yeah. And that's going to depend upon your skill set. Obviously, if you're a designer, you may be the person that makes your websites beautiful, attractive to human beings. On the other hand, if you're a physicist, mathematician, computer, you may want to put them into coding, you know, yeah. especially if that's their love. But the, the other thing is that you need to identify what people really enjoy. And the term I used to say is that, to my uh, faculty, I said, if you woke up in the middle of the night and you started to think about your position here, what would be the usual thing you would think about? Oh, how can I do a, a, a better thing with my patients? How can I do something? Oh, what's this really exciting discovery I might be able to make through my research? Hmm, how could I actually educate learners so they can become the most wonderful physicians in the bed. So then you shape these and so you try to funnel people as they develop their career into folks that are clinician experts, specialists that do that yeah. predominantly, those that are predominantly researchers, those that are educators and then you also have to find people like other stuff and so for example 
when I was leading the two organizations. Computers came from almost nowhere when I started. Right. <laughs> I'm so old that I remember when fax machines came in. Right. Well, came in. Came in, yeah. I mean, now they're a historic piece that most people your age don't even know what a fax machine is. Fax machine. Is. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, I bought my first computer in 1986. So as you go through this, it was part of the adapt adaption. But that, again, is part of the um, getting this evolved into your faculty. You have to leverage these new advances. So who do you choose as a champion? Well, you could do one thing. You could bring in the head of IT and come in with the faculty and have everybody fall asleep or be passive aggressive. Right. Or if you could find in your faculty of three, four hundred people, three people who just love computers. Yeah. They happen to be docs. And they, they, maybe, but they have a passion. They do this. But man, they love computers. So you sit down with them as a leader and say, you know what? Continue doing your great job in clinical care, education, research, the combination. But you know, we really need to bring in this new aspect of our uh, electronic healthcare room. Would you do this? And of course, instead of this being a burden right. for them, it's a joy. It's a non financial benefit, right? Because yeah. we're all driven by financial benefits and non financial benefits. Sure. Right? Yes. You have to have enough uh, salary or performance based income so that you can pay the bills, send your kids to college, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. You want to live. So you have to reach, just make sure that your system gives you enough financial reward to achieve that. But then after that, job satisfaction, uh, non-financial rewards are really important. That's cool. To motivate people to do that. So again, getting back to your original question, from being, you know, in the early part of my career where you're one of, I'm just throwing out a number 10 pulmonologists in one of the divisions of a big organization, to as you go up the leadership, you have to remember these kinds of aspects. Yeah, that's love. I honestly, I think it's beautiful. There's a couple of things there. One, performance management versus career development is, I think that is just a, a, a magical way to demonstrate the power of the vocabulary or words. And then the other thing about the, the clarity on expectations as the role has now shifted and having those conversations with your with your team so that way it's not just like, okay, now I'm the lead. Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, well, what does that mean? And yeah. So having those conversations proactively would be a really important part of it. And again, having everybody understand that on our team that is trying to achieve this goal, what's everybody's role? And just as I said, there's there will be a few docs that love computers. On the other hand, there will be a lot of docs that don't want to have anything to do with administration. You know right. what I mean? I went to medical school. I want to look after patients. Why on Earth, God's whatever. earth <laughs> yeah. are you asking me to sit on this committee and administering and making these new systems and doing this? And so, of course, you have the opposite thing so that you, you say that, well, you know what? My job, I know you guys don't like it. i got to sit in meetings all day long as the chair of the pediatric physician in chief. Yeah. And in fact, actually, my one of my, I used to call it my respite when I was at Hospital for Sick Children, you spend a significant majority of your time doing administrative stuff, which right. a little bit of it's pretty interesting, a lot of it's pretty not interesting. Not interesting. <laughs> so I used to book one day a week where I could go back over to my research lab and I'd walk over there and I would enjoy you know, the things that I loved about research, and so I used to call it my respite time. You know, I not good. only was because I wanted, you know, I hopefully contributed something positive to the research endeavor, yeah. but also for me, uh, it was, uh, I would say, work sustenance, where right. you get this... Get the energy back. Yeah, you get some energy, you feel good about it, and, and uh, just like this, I am in the car. Yeah, this is. I, mean, I love you it. work. You work for this company. Yeah. So you know, did they? Was this part of the job description? Definitely when not. You, definitely not. So yeah. obviously, Stefan and whoever else identified this, you probably came up with an idea, and they thought, you know, that's pretty good, and so it helps your career. You're excited, and you're obviously getting tremendous non-financial reward by Big being time. allowed to do this. So yeah. you're basically pumped, you're enthusiastic. So every day you come to work and you're you're like this, you know, guy on the on the bench that's going rah rah, let's go and team. It, and it's it's true because uh, I, I say this to a lot of people, this is like one of the highlights of my week doing this. And sure. the opportunity to speak with someone like you. Yeah. And so switching gears then, um, we, we were talking a little bit before we started driving around how 
you know, you've, you've had a lot of experience in seeing the impact of the health of young children, specifically with lung issues. Um, but I asked you the question about, like, is there any impact with family or the home unit, uh, family unit or at home, that helps support the ongoing health of children uh, once they are, you know, either being treated or post-treatment or whatever like that. And I was just curious if there's any ideas you had for people that might be either experiencing that or just understanding the impact of what it's like to contribute from like a home environment to the health of a child. Yeah. Let me first frame sure. my response. Yeah. We are so lucky that sort of 90 to 95% of all children are healthy and other than getting a suture and getting their vaccine from, you know, uh, vaccines all the time. Right, yeah, yeah. All, all the, the time, time. All the time. And getting sutured. Uh, what, you mean you don't, they're, they're you don't like, you're not a fan of polio? Uh, <laughs> oh, details, details. <laughs> yeah. They're really lucky. Then there's another few percent that needs, you know, specialist care like a pump. And then there's about 1% that really have major, major problems. Right. You know, whether it's acquired diseases, inherited diseases, or for example, children that are born quite prematurely. And this is one of my major, well, really my lifelong focus was to study the uh, lung disease that happens when infants are born very prematurely. Right. And you probably have seen this on TV where they, baby, instead of being 40 weeks inside uh, the mother's uterus, ends up being born at uh, 24 weeks and they end up with bad lung disease. They're on ventilators for a long time. Right. These children were critically ill. Uh, many parents, many docs think that a lot of them may not live or they come out with various other problems. So there are huge, significant problems. And so part of my research was to study what are the mechanisms underneath this. But the other thing is that as medicine advanced, a lot of these children could be saved, but then they ended up with permanent uh, problems with their lungs. Right. And uh, so you'd have these parents who would have a baby that was born prematurely, life and death, and this goes on for weeks, sometimes in months, and then finally the wonderful day comes when they get to take the baby home because right. things have gone well. Yeah. And there may be other aspects. Maybe they still need some medications or a little bit of this, or maybe they still need oxygen. One of the things that I used to always say to the parents, now that the baby's out of the intensive care unit, the most important thing you can do for your child is to avoid the crystal vase syndrome. And of course the parents would look crystal vase syndrome. <laughs> I thought this is crazy. I th I, yeah, I thought this guy was supposed to know what he's talking about, <laughs> but clearly he's had a break with reality. <laughs> But then I would go on to explain, and I said, you've had a critically ill child, and what's really important, yes, I'll work with you, and you'll work to sort of maximize his lung health and other things that are going on. But most importantly, as a psychosocial, you cannot treat, or you should not treat your child as a crystal vase, where you're putting the child up on a thing, and you're not allowing the child to go out and interact and do things like that. So my end point was, yes, you want to promote them going out if they're doing sports, doing this. Yes, yeah. you want them to interact with all the children so they learn how to develop and talk and play with other children. Sure, you use common sense. If there's a bunch of flu going around and, you know, half the kids got influenza, you don't send your child with lung disease, yeah. you know, to the, the party. You may have to do that. But in general, you do your utmost to say, because they are, my child is a normal child. They may need to have approaches different, some medications, and there may be limitations on their life, but you need to treat them as normally as possible because if you treat them as a crystal vase, you will be adding, you know, I wouldn't say this overtly to the parent, but sure. they'll figure it out, you'll be adding to their disease burden. But again, this is a psychosocial disease burden, which can be as important or at times more important, more important yeah. than the actual, the term we use is organic, you know, sort of the standard run of the mill uh, diseases Medical that condition. are not minimizing that, but right. it's, it's both because the health of a child is both your ability to, to uh, function from all the things that you think of from a, a uh, 
physical type of a point of view, but also your mental health is just as well. And the best thing that a parent can do is to make the life at home as appropriate as possible. But getting back to our other discussion earlier, one of the facts of these is that in treating them as normal children, you set expectations for your children in a loving way. Right. You set boundaries for them. It's not important where the boundaries are. You Parents can have loose boundaries or tight boundaries. But consistent boundaries. But consistent boundaries yeah. because if you're a little two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, if the boundaries change all the time, it's not very good. If you think of intrigue, it's not very good. Or even just think of the baseball game last night where sadly the Blue Jays lost. Okay. If a batter <laughs> came up to bat, and one time he came up to bat and four balls, he got to first base. But then the next time it was three balls. The next time it was five balls. Right, he would have Or no the next idea. time he had one, one strike and the umpire says you're out. The yeah. next time he gets to swing five times and he's right. not out. You would have a pretty confused adult batter. Yeah. <laughs> And sadly, too many parents do the same thing to their kid. Right. Well, one time you can do this, that's just fine. The next time, not cool. choker chain. Right. The next time, well, you always do this. The next time they give them liberty. Well, of course, right. there's going to be confusion in a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old teenager. Right. And so it's, I never go on to, you know, should you be a strict parent or a totally lax parent? but you need to work with your partner, husband, wife, spouse, etc., and say, you know, here's how we're gonna, do, and here's the boundaries. There can be little fuzzy boundaries, sure. but you know, that's what you need. And if you think about it, your own work life or baseball team and think, you know, well, why are some kids struggling? It's because sometimes one strike you're out, one time you can swing five times. And you don't know. You don't know. And that's cool. So if you were to uh, go back and, and talk to yourself before you started your leadership journey knowing what you know now what would you tell yourself back then um well one of the th there's a saying about old too soon and smart too late you learn a lot over your career <laughs> old too soon and smart too late that's right and um i think there's two things one is there's some basic principles the fact of clear expectations the things i've talked about always will be there the uh, there will always be life will throw you new challenges but they're just dressed up in different ways you know it's it's like the movies they say that the events you know <laughs> we've not named people because you know this story has played before different right, things right. and the same you know we've talked about fax machines yeah. i mean when fax machines first came out there was a lot of pushback by a small percentage of the population like what do you mean i'm using fax machines or when the first ATM came out. Right. I'm not going to trust this ATM. So, if if you look at the adaptations that are in electronic health care, right, there are always changes and innovation. So, as a leader, you have to say, how can I support my team to have them both engage, take up, adopt new technologies, new approaches, whether it's in how people interact right. from a psychosocial point of view or as a technology or whatever, and get it through. And I, I, I really do like that sort of circle, you know, where you have the innovators, the early adapters, yeah. late adapters, and then the few that are... The laggards. Maybe, well, we, we, I'll let you, you know, there's, there's, they can the be... Resistors. Count, yeah, <laughs> they, they can be counter... It doesn't matter what happens or how it changes, they'll, they'll still... Uh, be challenged yeah that's but, uh, cool but no I mean that's it and you, you continuously learn and I think the thing is that if you do not continuously learn and challenge yourself and I think that is one of the advantages of my career as a research you know having research as a component true researchers realize of what we currently today believe to be true people say half of it's not true or half will be changed or modified that you continuously challenge so challenging well, or questioning it's awesome unless you're in the middle you know on the other hand if you're in the army and you're about to attack you know you can't have all your privates arguing with people when you are so the, again, yeah i you, guess there is you, some extreme environments where you can't really be doing that on a daily basis that's right i mean it, it, it you know the income the uh, uh, intrigue company here i mean the more innovations and different i mean that make sure company thrive and do that on the other hand i'm taking the other extreme if you're going into battle yeah. you need a pure hierarchical to do this because otherwise people die 
people die and you're never going to win. So I, again, it's the skill of what do I need to do? The same thing if you go into an operating room. Boy, is it rigid. Yeah. Because, you know, you have to have the right yeah. people in the right place with the right tools. You do your checklists. You do this because you can't afford to have innovation of, oh, I'm going to put this scalpel on another tray or, you know. See what happens. Some, I'm yeah, use just a see what happens. You know, maybe it'll work out better. You yeah. know what I mean? In the operating room is not the time to change it. Yes. On the battlefield is not the time to change it. Correct. But there is times in both those environments where you can challenge the status quo, which yeah. is which is interesting. I really love that framing. Yeah. And then what you do is you come out of it and you debrief. Yeah. So now in operating rooms, they go through a very standard checklist before they do everything. You know, this is Johnny or Susie and we're doing this and we're, we're just doing that procedure. and manifesto. Have you heard that's, of that? Uh, checklist manifesto. I've not read the book, but I... It's all about that. Yeah, it's all about that. And then afterwards, you can have regularly scheduled debriefs. In other words, this month, how have things gone? What's our performance? What we're doing? And then, of course, no matter what you do, I'm sure Intrigue has had things where mistakes have been made. No, certainly not in, us. <laughs> certainly in healthcare, there's been mistakes. So right. really... Um, what you need to do there is that you need to have a setup where you go through and find the, what's called the critical factors, you know, what went wrong. And, and certainly in healthcare, we use this analogy, and you probably use it the same thing here, is that it's called the holes in the Swiss cheese all lined up. Because usually there may be something goes wrong, right? Some terrible thing in healthcare, sadly. But then what happens when you look at the sequence of events, there was this thing here and that thing there, this thing here, and there was, and really often the major things that need to be changed are back there. Right. I mean, if you think of the current Boeing 737 MAX 8, right? right? Everybody's focused on whether the pilots did or did not know what to do in those two things. But really, Boeing wanted to stick with their 737. They wanted bigger engines, so they put them on a different part of the wing Right. made the aircraft inherently unstable so they figured well we've got to develop a way of of, of uh, de correcting this automatic software you have coders they then put a sensor outside to see which direction it is they then only put one sensor instead of two and then they do the software and they said well we're not going to really tell the pilots anything about this whole software so when you think about it the error happened way back here yeah there's multiple facts so there are multiple holes in the Swiss piece of Swiss cheese they all lined up and tragically a lot of people lost their lives yeah. and indirectly there's it's going to have an impact on Boeing so a lot of you know ordinary working folks are going to be impacted negatively by this yeah so that's where I think when you say what do you learn whenever something positive happens you celebrate with your people you give them prizes awards and say you know you have those things and when things don't go as well, you really have to sit back and say, you know, what were the various contributing factors right. that led to that? That's cool. Well, I really do appreciate you doing this here. It means a lot. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay, yeah, cool. See you, everybody.